Hey everybody, um, today we are going to talk about the Roman Republic. So this is the first part of our second unit on Rome. So the first unit was early Rome. This unit is the Roman Republic. And then the last unit that we'll do of the year is the Roman Empire. So the Roman Republic is the government of Rome. And Republic is a system of government. Um, there are going to be parts of this that are very familiar to you because the United States gets some of its government ideas from the Roman Republic. What we did is we took democracy, where everybody votes, um, from Greece, and Republic from ancient Rome, where people vote for people to make decisions and merge them together to form the kind of government that we have, which is called a democratic republic. All right, so here's how that new system starts. Because remember, the Romans at first had kings, like we were talking about Lucius Tarquinius um, was the first Etruscan ruler of Rome. Well, by the year 509 BCE, the Romans get tired of Etruscan kings being in charge. And they revolt against the last Etruscan king, whose name was Tarquin the Proud. This is not Lucius Tarquinius, but it's one of his descendants. And when we say the Proud, that doesn't mean like it means today. Like, oh, I'm so proud of you. Great job. It kind of means like the arrogant. So this could be, you know, like Tarquin could be called Tarquin the Arrogant. They set up a republic. Um, for where people um, choose their rulers. So here is a little story about that. So if you're wondering a little more about Tarquin the Proud, there you go. So he's the last king in ancient Rome. Then they go to this republic form of government. He's not a good king. He's a tyrant. The people of Rome hate him. Um, so this story that I'm about to tell you is kind of a myth as to what happened to Tarquin the Proud. Okay, so here's the story. A long time ago, the city of Rome was ruled by kings. Sometimes these kings were Roman, sometimes these kings were Etruscan. At the time of this legend, the Romans were ruled by an Etruscan king named Tarquin the Proud. Tarquin was a terrible king. His, his rule was cruel and unjust. unjust. The Roman people revolted against Tarquin and defeated him. They then exiled him back to the Etruscan League, which is like the Etruscan home territory. So Tarquin goes to the Etruscans and says, can you help me? Um, the Etruscans see how rich Rome was and decide if they help Tarquin gain power again, he'd hook him up with some money. So they sent their army with Tarquin to conquer Rome. Rome was surprised that the Etruscans decided to help Tarquin. Um, the Roman army hadn't been, you know, unified back together. Uh, farmers and villagers living outside of Rome saw, here come the Etruscans with Tarquin, Tarquin, and they fled into the city of Rome for protection. One of Rome's best natural defenses was the Tiber River, which you'll remember from the last unit, um, is a river right in the, the city of Rome. If the Romans could get their people across the bridges of the Tiber, then the people can um, knock down the bridges and they'd be safe from Tarquin and Etruscans trying to get into Rome. So the Roman commanding general had forgotten about the bridges when he was getting his, ready to, um, his army ready to fight the Etruscans. So on their own, the Romans are like, oh my gosh, the bridges, we got to stop this. They knocked down a lot of the bridges over the Tiber, but one bridge stood still. Tarquin saw the bridge and sent his army rushing towards it. There were a couple Roman soldiers guarding the bridge. They were totally outnumbered by the Etruscans, but they knew if they didn't stop the Etruscans and knock down this bridge, Rome was doomed. So here comes this story. And you might be thinking, wasn't that the story? No, that was like the story before the story. So a long time ago, around 510 BCE, the ancient Romans said, enough, we've had it with you 
King Tarquin the Proud, the mean, the nasty, and the unfair. Go away, leave our city. And they kicked him out. Tarquin didn't like that much. He went to the Etruscans. He said, I need some help. Rome throw me out. They must pay. The Etruscans said, sure, we'll give you some help. We'll give you an army. And back Tarquin came. Rome was taken by surprise. The people who lived in the surrounding countryside fled through their own, fled towards Rome as fast as they could. They poured across the narrow wooden bridge over the Tiber that connected Rome with its farm fields on the other side, seeking refuge in the walled city of Rome. The Etruscan army was on their heels. Inside the city, the Romans were in such a panic and so disorganized that once their people were safely inside, they forgot to destroy their bridge. Or perhaps it never occurred to them to do so. Led by Tarquin the Proud, who knew his way around Rome pretty well, the Etruscan army headed for the narrowest piece of the Tiber, where, of course, the Romans had built their bridge. Imagine their delight when they discovered the Romans had left the bridge for them to cross. They would not have to swim the Tiber to reach Rome. It was a disaster. If the Etruscans crossed the bridge, they would take Rome. Horatius, a young Roman soldier, called to his friends, Come on! will hold the bridge while the others chop it down. His friends froze. They were terrified at the thought of facing an entire army. Then, at least chop the bridge down while I hold them off alone, Horatius pleaded. He stood on the bridge and faced the Etruscan army alone. Who among you is brave enough to face a Roman soldier, he shouted. The Etruscans threw spears at him. But they were some distance away, and the bridge itself gave Horatius protection. Horatius stood firm, fighting like a hero. When the Etruscans tried to cross the narrow bridge, Horatius cut them down. Two of his friends rushed out to help him. Behind them, other young soldiers were frantically sawing at the heavy cords that held the bridge. Horatius felt the bridge give way. Go back, he shouted to his friends. His friends raced for the protection of the walled city. It was hopeless, they thought. One man cannot stop an entire army. Only the gods could save them now. But Horatius was right. The bridge was giving way. As the bridge began to fall, Horatius turned and dived into the Tiber. The gods were with him. He swam back to Rome safely and received a hero's welcome. The Etruscan army fell back. How could one man face an army and live? They believed this was an omen, which you remember is like a sign they thought could, they could predict the future. They didn't wish to anger the gods. It was true what they said about Rome. It was a divine city. Tarquin the Proud screamed and shouted and carried on something awful, but nothing he said could convince the Etruscan army to swim the Tiber and fight Rome. The Etruscan army went back home, and they never came back again. The Roman people vowed never to be ruled by a king again, nor were they. They went on to establish for the first time in history a government by the people and for the people of Rome known as the Roman Republic. All right, so let me go back to the notes and talk about this system of government as my computer is now super slow. And okay, here we go. We're back. Oh, hold on. What happened here? No, that's part two. That's, that's not for today. Where's my. That's part two, too. What? Where's my, here it is. Sorry, let me load part one. This has got to be entertaining. Mr. Gujic's documents won't load. Good times. All right, so the Roman people were divided into two classes. And this I know we know already from the notes on Roman life in the last unit. There are the patricians, that's the rich, and the plebeians or plebeians, that's the not rich. The patricians make up about 10% of the population, but controlled the government because they were the only ones at first allowed to have power in this new republic. The plebeians were citizens. They paid taxes and served in the army, but they couldn't marry patricians because they couldn't afford the dowry, the payment. They also couldn't serve in the government. So Remember how we learned in ancient times when people get married, it's a business deal between families. Nobody is marrying um, who they want to personally, like their families choose. So essentially what would happen is if a woman was getting married, 
um, the other family of the person she's marrying would pay the family of the woman to have their child marry her. That's called a dowry, a payment. So the price to marry a patrician woman was so much that no plebeian could ever afford it. And that's why patricians and plebeians didn't get married. All right, next. Until about 450 BCE, Roman laws were not written down. So the Romans decided they should be written so that everyone knew what the laws of Rome were. And they were carved on these 12 bronze tablets um, that together, when they set up the tablets all next to each other, it looked like little tables. So the nickname for the laws of Rome was called the 12 Tables. And they placed it in the forum because that's where people went to hang out. And laws applied to both patricians and plebeians. The plebeians slowly started to gain more power through this um, position known as the tribunes. The tribunes are basically kind of people that speak up for the little guy. They're like the activists that um, are trying to make things better for those that don't have it too well off. And the, through the work of the tribunes, eventually the plebeians can serve in the government. All right, so let's get into this government structure. So I have this like weird little chart thing that's blank. Um, I'm going to show you the weird little chart thing. It all filled in and then go over where it is. Where's my, here it is. Government Rome filled in. All right, so when we look at the Roman Republic governor, government of Rome, um, what just happened to my document? It went nuts. Let's try making it in Google Docs. I tried this before and it didn't look nuts, but now it just, this, like, what is this? This is just madness. I know some of you are like, this isn't madness, it's Sparta. All right, here we go. Now we can see it. Um, so at the top of the Roman style of government is two consuls. So two consuls ruled Rome together. They are the administrators and military, military leaders. So one consul would be in charge of the military. The other one would be in charge of everyday Rome. They each have veto power, and veto means to say no. So if each if a law needed to be passed, both consul number one and consul number two had to agree. And when I numbered these one and two, that didn't mean like consul number one is more powerful than consul number two. They are equal in power. I just did that so you know that there are two of them. So they each have veto power. So if one of them disagrees on something, it's not happening. Um, so they both have to agree before a law is passed. And the consuls were chosen every year. So every year there was an election and there were two new consuls um, that were elected. Now, I'm going to go through the process of how they chose consuls after I explain all the other kind of government systems. So at the top of the government are these two consuls. The next most powerful position is the Senate. Yes, that's where we got um, our Senate name from, from the Roman Senate, except our Senate has some similarities, but lots of differences from the Roman Senate. So they handle the everyday affairs of the Roman government it is made up of 300 men. Unfortunately, once again, um, if you were a woman, you cannot participate in the government. And these 300 men served for life. So when you were chosen to be a senator, you had that position till you died for life. They serve as advisors to the consuls. They approve contracts for public works, that's buildings and stuff. They propose laws. So the Senate says this should be a law, and then it goes to the consuls, and the consuls either both agree and it becomes a law, or both disagree or one disagrees, and then it gets vetoed and it's not a law. All right, now, here's the, the kind of thing. 
So every year, two new consuls are chosen, and you had to be a senator to be a consul. So um, two of the 300 people were elected to consul to be a consul each year. Now, there are three other groups down below. We have the judges, the assembly, and the tribunes. Okay, so judges, what happened to my weird thing? Let's, boxes aren't, I did this on, no, no, no. I did this on Microsoft, and for some reason it's not translating. Oh, there we go. Um, I know it's super tiny, but I'll read it. So, um, judges determined if someone committed a crime. So let's just do a little... Come on, computer. Computer is being very moody today. Yes. Okay. Let's just try a little. This. No, that's not what I want. Anyway, I'll fix it later for the, the notes, um, for the, the version that you see. But judges determined if somebody committed a crime. The assembly, um, it's made up of all Roman citizens. So again, we're not talking about women. We're not talking about kids. We're not talking about slaves. Unfortunately, they don't have citizenship rights. So the people um, in ancient Rome that are not women, children, slaves are part of the assembly. They declare war and they also declare peace. So you see some similarities between um, some of the Greek governments. And then there's that position of the tribune that I talked about. Their job is to protect the rights of of the plebeians they're kind of the activists that look out for the little guys so let me explain this in a nutshell all right so every year two consuls are picked you had to be a senator to be chosen to be consul so you're picked out of the 300 men but the senate doesn't get to vote on it the assembly does so when it's time for a consul election, the um, senators are all running to be consul. And they can't vote for consul. The assembly has to vote for consul. Now, when, let's say, a senator died and it's time for a new senator, a consul would pick them. And a lot of times it would be one of the leading people in the assembly, um, like a lot of times these tribunes. Now... I know that's not exactly the most clear picture of things, so you might be thinking, Mr. Gujic, I'm a little confused. Can you show me this in video form with stick figures? Sure. So um, this is going to do kind of a good job of explaining the Roman style of governments. So here we go. When the Romans overthrew their Etruscan rulers in the year 509 BCE, they weren't just changing their political status. They were establishing a form of government that would influence politics for thousands of years to come. Upon freeing themselves from the conquering Etruscans of the north, the Romans formed a republic, a system of government in which citizens choose representatives to govern on their behalf. With this, they established a governmental system which was a precursor to many in a modern day world. To understand the political structure of the Roman Republic, we must first understand the importance of social class. The natural born inhabitants of the Republic, who were not slaves, were broken into two main groups. They were the patricians, members of the upper class, including the nobility and wealthy landowners, and the plebeians, or the common people of Rome. Unlike today's society, where people can move up and down the social ladder, the patricians and plebeians of Rome were completely separate and distinct. Intermarriage between the classes was forbidden. Making these social classes even more of a dividing line, whether a man was a patrician or a plebeian, dictated what position he could hold within the beginning political structure of the Republic. If a man was a patrician, he could hold the highest position in government, known as consul. Since this position oversaw the workings of the government and its officials, while also being the commander of the army outside the city of Rome, we can draw some loose parallels to it and the American presidency. However, unlike the presidency, 
two patrician men ruled as consul. They had the power to veto one another and were limited to a one-year term. In times of crisis, and in order to make swift, concise decisions, one man could be elevated to dictator over the Republic. Okay, that's an important thing I forgot to mention. Um, in time, I'm going to reiterate what the video just said. In times of crisis, one man could be given the power of dictator, which means whatever they say goes. Um, and that's in times of like war and things like that. And the Senate has to vote um, for this to happen at first. But eventually what's going to happen is um, if the person is really popular and has the um, support of the public, um, there's sometimes that the assembly can kind of make that decision. Trying to make sure the patricians could keep control, the consuls were elected from the Senate, a group of 300 patricians who were in essence the lawmakers of Rome. They made decisions on spending while also controlling taxation and relationships with foreign powers. Again, we can loosely compare the Roman Senate to the legislative branch of the American government. However, there are some major differences. Perhaps most obvious, the senators of Rome were not chosen by the citizens. They were chosen by the consul, and they were elected for life. The last governing body of the Roman Republic was the assembly. The assembly allowed plebeians or common citizens into its membership. Like the First Amendment right to assemble, the Assembly had the right to assemble in the Forum, or the Marketplace and Business Center of Rome. Fortunately for the Assembly, they had one ace up their sleeve. As the Republic aged, they were in charge of choosing the Consul. Yes, the Councils were elected from the Senate, but not by the Senate. The honor of choosing went to the Assembly. Since the Assembly chose the Consuls, any Senator hoping to gain the highest position in government needed to win the favor of the assembly. Just imagine a wealthy patrician courting a common plebeian. This setup allowed the wealthier plebeians who were not patricians, no matter how much money they made, to wield substantial power. It was politics at its best. With this setup, it's not hard to imagine why the assembly gained power. They were also given the right to elect tribunes, a position which acted very much like a president of the plebeians. The man holding this position had the right to intervene on legal matters and veto legislation. He also held the right to summon the Senate, even making proposals for their consideration. Between 449 and 450 BCE, the plebeians of Rome gained another victory through the Law of the Twelve Tables. These were a code of laws which spelled out civil matters, crime and punishment, and relationships among citizens and family members. Most important about these new laws, both patricians and plebeians were bound by them. Soon following the law of the 12 tables, the assembly had gained such power that plebeians were given the right to marry patricians and even a plebeian could be counsel. Ironically, the growing power of the assembly would be blamed for the fall of the Republic. Okay, so that's a lot to take in, I know. Um, but just to kind of show you again, um, let me get to where they're all labeled this nice little picture here. All right, so there's two consuls, right? So what happens is this. Um, in order to be a consul, you have to be a senator. The people that vote who's going to be consul are down here in the assembly. In order to be a senator, a lot of times you had to have a leadership in the assembly like a tribune. So the consul picks somebody to be in the, somebody to be a senator from the assembly. Um, the assembly picks somebody to be consul from the Senate and the Senate make the laws and serve for life. All right, it is confusing stuff, but I, I think you have a better handle it thanks to my lovely stick figure friends. All right. So that does it for um, the notes for today. Um, if you have questions, obviously you can pop into the chat. And like I said, um, the filled in version of all this, including um, the chart correctly, is all in the notes. All right. 
You get to awkwardly watch me hit stop again. Here it comes. I clicked it. Delayed reaction. Come on, computer. This is awkward. <laughs>